Welcome to Tapestry Church. We hope you had a great Christmas, even though things probably looked a lot different this year. Just know that all the blessings of Christmas never change, and we're happy you're here with us today. We are glad you're joining us, whether it's in person, in the parking lot, or on a live stream. Now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. It is not over, this birthing. There are always newer skies into which God can throw stars. When we begin to think that we can predict the advent of God, that we can box the Christ in a stable in Bethlehem, that's just the time that God will be born in a place we can't imagine and won't believe. Those who wait for God watch with their hearts and not their eyes, listening, always listening for angel words. As we enter this time of prayer this morning, I would remind you that all of our prayer requests for our community can be found each week in the e-news that goes out electronically and can be found in our Facebook group. So if you have prayer requests, you're welcome to share those with the staff, and we will make sure that those get published and shared with the congregation. Let us go to God this morning in silent prayer. God of glory, your splendor shines from a manger in Bethlehem, where the light of the world is humbly born into the darkness of human night. Open our eyes to Christ's presence in the shadows of our world, so that we, like him, may become beacons of your justice and defenders of all for whom there is no room. We ask these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 to 32. Listen with me for God speaking to us this day. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male shall be designated as Holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him,
what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Nunc Dimittis is what I am calling this sermon because it seems fitting for this time even though the words, being in Latin, may sound unfamiliar, it means, Lord, let your servant depart in peace, a phrase from today's text from the Gospel of Luke. In the long history of the church, that phrase has often been set to music and has been used frequently at the conclusion of services of worship. In fact, in the chalice hymnal in the pews of many of our congregations, has a setting of this text from Luke found on page 156 of the hymnal. There you will see the words, Nunc Dimittis, and a poetic telling of this story from Jesus' early life. We do not have a lot of information about Simeon, a priest who encounters the Holy Family. All we know about him is contained in these few verses. Mary and Joseph bring their baby, who they have named Jesus, to the temple for him to be circumcised and for Mary to participate in acts of ritual purification following giving birth. These practices go back to the earliest days of the Jewish people, to the time of Moses, and normally they would have been conducted on the eighth day following birth. It was while Joseph and Mary are at the temple in Jerusalem that they encounter Simeon and a woman named Anna. Both were devout religious leaders who spent their days worshiping, fasting, and praying to God. Each of them clearly recognized the uniqueness of the child Mary and Joseph brought that day, and they were moved to a sense of jubilation. Simeon is the one I want to focus on mostly today. He is the one who says, Nunc Dimittis, or something close to that. According to our text, the Spirit of God has revealed to him that he will be privileged to see the long-awaited Messiah of God in his lifetime. Perhaps as the years went by, as his energy waned, as his eyesight began to fail, he wondered if that would ever actually come true. But the day that Mary and Joseph and Jesus showed up, he knew that it had. Nunc Dimittis, he says. Now I can go. Now, O oh God, let me go from this assignment of maintaining this sacred space. I have seen it all. I have seen what you have promised. So the next day he called the pension fund and let them know he was retiring. Now, Simeon was Jewish, so he did not literally say nunc dimittis, which is Latin. He said something similar, likely, in Hebrew or Aramaic. If he had been French-speaking, maybe he would have said, voila! Had he been Greek, maybe he would have said, eureka! He had come to a place of completion of resolution, of satisfaction, of accomplishment, of ending and release. He had gained his release and was retiring from his long service. This makes me wonder about us in this moment. Not unlike Simeon and Anna, you and I have been doing a lot of waiting in this time. Now, it is not safe in any way for us to move about, to travel or congregate in ways that are customary. We have hope that sometime in the coming year that will change. But for now, we are stuck in this holding pattern. 
the scriptures say of Anna, Simeon's partner, that she never left the temple night or day. That sounds like, a, like our own experience in these days of the COVID pandemic. But as you read about these two, Simeon and Anna, though they may have been sequestered, they do not appear to be trapped. They were patient until the time came. Those are the exact words in the story, the time came. Can you exercise that same patience right now? Can you help others do so? Patience is defined as the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting upset or angry. Some seem to be born with a knack for it, but it is also a skill that can be developed. Behavioral scientists and spiritual directors say to increase our patient's capacity. We should stop doing things that are not important, be mindful of the things that make us impatient, and take deep breaths. I like that last one, deep breathing. When we relax our muscles and force ourselves to slow down, calm has a way of catching up with us. But I also think the counsel about stopping doing the things that are not important is wise as well. Maybe the thing that gave Simeon and Anna the capacity to patiently and comfortably wait as long as they did was because they knew they were waiting for something really important, the presence of a child who would be cloaked with God's salvation. Nothing else mattered as much as that. The assumption has often been made by many, by me at times for sure, that the accounting of Simeon we read in the Gospel of Luke is all there is to his life from that point forward. That his retirement from the temple meant that his life was over. But that is an erroneous assumption with nothing in the Scriptures to support it. Just because someone retires does not mean that their life is over. In fact, Greek language scholars have studied this text and note that the verb form used for dismiss is in the indicative, not the imperative tense. In other words, Simeon is declaring release from his responsibilities. He is not being commanded to leave the temple. He not others, has made this decision. He recognizes that his work there is complete. So what happened to Simeon after that day? We can only speculate. We have no information in the Scripture. Maybe he moved to the suburbs. Hilo, just outside the city, might have been a good choice. Or he, maybe he moved to the oasis of Jericho, north of Jerusalem. The orange groves there are fantastic. Maybe he filled in as an interim priest from time to time, here and there, as needed. Maybe he became a spiritual director or a life coach. Maybe he wrote a book about his life journey or took up painting. Maybe he developed a new skill, carpentry, gardening, or calligraphy. Maybe he finally had the time to read the stack of scrolls that had been accumulating. Maybe he became a docent, guiding others to discover historical sites. Maybe he had the time to help friends in need, unencumbered by the schedule his professional life had required. Maybe he became a mentor to younger priests who were still trying to find their way. We do not know what became of his life and what he did, but there were lots of possibilities. And it is a misreading of this text to think that his life was through. It was not. Opportunity was ahead. And maybe while he was waiting for the Messiah to show up, he was also doing some post-Messiah planning. I would like to think so. How about you? Perhaps a good use of your days now might be spent planning 
for what your life, your family's life, your church's life, our society's life might look like after the pandemic. When our Nunc Dimittis Day comes, it does not have to be the same as before. And likely, it should not be the same as before. We all have a chance to start fresh and new, a grand reset to how we live and work and relate to one another. Maybe that is what the salvation and revelation Simeon talked about really means, that God's Spirit is released in our midst to connect us and all of God's children across the whole inhabited earth in a new and better way. Oh, wow. That would be something worth waiting for. That would be something worth planning for. That could be really great. That time is not quite yet. We still need patience in a time of waiting. But that day will come when vaccines are available and this dread disease is no more and health is restored. And then we can each say, voila, or eureka, or nunc dimittis. We have been released. Thanks be to God. So may God's blessing be on each one of you. May God's blessing be on your congregation. And may God's blessing be on the one church we share. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I decided to put on my plumber's hat. Now, that was a scary thought in itself. But our bathroom drains were draining a little slow and needed to be plunged. And Jane's sink on the faucet, the aerator, was kind of clogged. And so the water was kind of just spraying out in all directions. Now, I have fixed those two things before. And so they didn't sound too overwhelming to me. Well, I got the plunger out and got the, the drains all flowing nicely. And then I took, got the pliers to move the aerator off to take it off. And as I did, I noticed that something felt strange with it in that not only did I get the aerator off the end of the, that little tip off the end of the faucet, 
but what it connects to also came off with it. And then I realized that it had broken off with it, and so the faucet was no longer usable. Well, I looked online at Lowe's and Home Depot and Menards and found a faucet to buy, but as I thought about it, I realized that there weren't any more of those old round crystal ball-like faucets really to buy anymore, and that my sink was only three feet away from hers, and it would look really strange to have one new faucet with a lever and the other one with the old crystal ball. So I decided to get two of those. Well, I got the faucets, started to put them on, and I realized that I was over my head really fast. And so I called our son Jason and pleaded with him to come. And so he came after work and put the new faucets on. Something strange happened when he was replacing my faucet, though. That faucet that I thought was perfectly fine, it looked fine. As he lifted it out, he said, oh my goodness. And we looked at it, and the hot water pipe was totally corroded and even bulged in a place, like it was about ready to corrode through all the way. And he said, this would have really been a mess had we not replaced this faucet and this pipe soon, or you would have had hot water spraying all over your bathroom. Well, I share this story with you because I think it is it paints a picture of how our lives are in 2020. This has been a rough year, hasn't it? Sometimes we can go through life and we try to have a positive attitude and try to keep our chin up. On the outside, we can look really good and like things are going well. But we know too often on the inside, we feel broken and about ready to pop like that faucet was from too much stress, from feelings of isolation, from not being able to be with our families and friends like we want to, or maybe living in fear that we might get the coronavirus or give it to someone else. It's just been a rough year. But this morning, as we prepare to receive communion, our Lord Jesus invites us to bring what we're feeling to him, to bring our feelings and come to him and to receive the healing that we need this morning for those broken feelings. As we prepare to receive these gifts from our Lord, let us join in prayer. Oh God, we confess to you that we are struggling right now. And as we open our hearts to you, we ask that you meet us at the point of our needs this morning. As we take this bread and juice into our bodies, we pray that you will refresh our souls and that you will bring healing and hope to our lives as you touch our lives with your love and your grace. We thank you and offer you our love in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as Jesus did with his disciples, he takes bread now and offers it to us and says, This is my body, broken for you, given for you as a gift of my love. Take and eat, remembering me. Jesus also took the cup when he was with his disciples and he told them this cup represents his blood shed for the forgiveness of their sins and shed for the forgiveness of our sins. He invites us now to take and drink and to find healing and hope through him. And now we share in the good news of the gospel message that through Jesus Christ, we receive unconditional love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Shepherd
concerns me, what lies on my heart is this, that we in the church, papered and programmed, articulate and agendaed, are telling the faith story all wrong, are telling it as though it happened 2,000 years ago, or is going to happen as soon as the church budget is raised. We seem to forget that Christ's name is Emmanuel, God with us, not just when he sat among us, but now when we cannot feel the nail prints in his hands. And so my challenge to you is this, go into the world remembering that God is with us. He is Emmanuel, here among us in this very moment.